Hello, everyone. Thank you. Uh, my name is Glenn Booth, and I'm chair of the organizing committee of the Black History Month luncheon here at the University of Toronto. Thank you. So, on behalf of the committee, thank you all for coming out to join us in the celebration of this, the 21st year of the luncheon here in the Great Hall at Hart House. So, after a couple of COVID-enforced years absence, it literally feels so good to actually look over the room and see a rainbow colors of peoples and cultures. It feels good. I'd like to share the story of the inclusive genesis of this lunch. It really started with a bunch of myself and co-workers of all races and cultures having lunches together in a small lunchroom across the way from this building. We shared different stories over lunches, and from that small lunchroom, the genesis of the idea of this lunch came about, and here we are 21 years later. On a, on a personal level, these lunches helped me to dispel some of my own ignorance about other cultures and other peoples. And my wish is, it's just a start, a small start, that this lunch and lunches like these across campus will help to dispel some ignorance, if not all, for some of the people who are here and who are watching online. So today we're here to celebrate black excellence, the past history of blacks, the present and future possibilities. I believe the future possibilities should include all groups coming together, forging a path of universal allyship to create a more just and equitable society for us and the children's, uh, the next generation's children. This is why the lunch invites everyone from every community to participate. And today, I personally have sent out invites to all communities across the university and beyond. So we'll have indigenous, we'll have LGBT, we'll have Southeast Asian, we'll have whites, and we'll have some of the other ones that I can't remember now. So. <laughs> Thank you all. The genesis of this is inclusion, and we are glad to welcome all. For a long time, blacks as a people have lived on these lands. And for a long time, we've had ongoing relationships and alliances with the indigenous peoples of this land. It is therefore quite appropriate for us to acknowledge this land in which the University of Toronto operates. Because for thousands of years, it has been the traditional land of the Huron Wendant, the Seneca, and the Mississaugas of the Credit. Today, this meeting place is still the home of many indigenous peoples from across the Turtle Island, and we are grateful to have the opportunity to work and learn in this land. So, that's enough speechifying. On the program today, we will have, of course, our honored guest, Cameron Daly, sitting right in the front uh, with us. Thank you. <laughs> of course, most of you will know that Cameron is the CEO of TIFF. Not only Cameron, but we'll have some music, we have some dancing, we'll have some spoken word poetry. So we're hoping it will be a fun lunch and the food will come shortly after. Thank you for coming out. To start this, to start this off, I would like to do what we traditionally do, to sing what we know as the National Black Anthem. And to perform the National Black Anthem, plus a couple of uh, my favorite Curtis Mayfield tunes as a medley. <laughs> we'll have 
Juno Award winning artist, Lazo, to be accompanied by Trish Campbell. So please welcome Lazo and Trish for a musical interlude. Lift every voice and sing Till earth and heaven rings Rings with the harmonies Of liberty Let our rejoicing rise High as a listening skies. Let it resound loud as the rolling seas. Sing a song full of the faith that the dark past has taught us. Sing a song full of the hope that the present has brought us. Facing the rising sun of a new day begun, let us march on till victory is won. Actually, it's going to be, we're just the, um, uh, what do you call that? Conductors, so we want you to sort of and make this like a audience participation thing. You know, it's not just us. It's everybody here tonight. So today, I want you to be singing with us and let's celebrate freedom, justice, and equality for black, white, aboriginal, and every color, race, and creed. Right, so we do a little thing from Curtis Mayfield for you, and would like you to join with us as much as you can. Okay, how was that? All right. Okay. Can I get a little more of the guitar? No child, and don't you cry. Your folks may understand you by and by. Just move on up, move on up towards your destination. To your destination. Though you may find from time to time complications. complications. your lip mm. and take a trip mm. your right head may be wet but you cannot sleep just move on up move on up and peace you will find peace you find into the steeple of beautiful people where there's only one kind so move on up so move on up just move on up. Come on, everybody. I want to hear you. Let's come on. Move on up. Move on up. Say move on up. 
Move on up. Move on up. I can hear ya. Move on up. Come on, move on up. Move on up. Let's move on up. Let's move on up. Move on up. Move on up. Remember your dreams are your only schemes. You gotta keep on pushing. Take nothing less, not even second best. Do not obey, you must have your say so you can pass the test. Come on, so move on up. Come on, people. Come on, let's move on up. Move on up. Move on up. So move on up. Move on up. Move on up. Hey, 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 Move on up. Move on up. Hey, 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 We gotta move on up. Yeah. Next one. One more. Amen. You ready? So come in. This is your song. We're just directing. We're just the conductors. Here we go. Here's the key. Amen. Sing it over. Amen. Sing it over. Amen. Yeah, man. Amen. 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 Bless her. All right, thank you. Thank you, Lazo and Tisha. Hello, thank thank you, Lazo and Tisha, for that. Um, you had a little bit of challenge. It's early and it's cold. <laughs> So the, uh, the president of the university is a, a fervent supporter of this event. He has always, during his tenure, been here. And I might go so far as to say the president loves the oxtails more than I as a Jamaican do. And literally, I'm not joking. <laughs> um, so at this time, please join me in welcoming President Merrick Gertler, who will make welcome remarks on behalf of the university. Unfortunately, he's out of, I think he's in Singapore someplace now, but we'll, he'll join us on by video feed. Please 
welcome President Mark Drekla. I am delighted to send greetings to all those gathered for the 2023 Black History Month luncheon. Students, alumni, faculty, and staff, as well as our friends and partners from the city around us. I'm also excited to hear that so many high school students are taking part in today's events. We hope to see you back at U of T in the years to come. I wish I could join you all, especially since this is the first time in three years that we've been able to hold this event in person and the food is always so delicious. Over the past year and a half, the U of T community has celebrated the launch of the Black Research Network, as well as the Black Founders Network. During spring convocation, we shone the spotlight on several outstanding black leaders through the awarding of honorary degrees, Denham Jolly, Winston LaRose, Camille Orridge, and Masai Ujiri. This past fall, we welcomed brilliant black students from across Canada and around the world. And through it all, we are continuing to implement the Scarborough Charter on Anti-Black Racism and Black Inclusion, an historic national initiative led by U of T faculty and staff, as well as the recommendations of our own Anti-Black Racism Task Force. All in all, we have a lot to celebrate and a lot to look forward to. So to all of you, congratulations on your accomplishments, individual and collective. Thank you for your contributions to the University of Toronto and to our society as a whole. And let me take this opportunity to thank Glenn Booth and the organizing team for your leadership in the great tradition of U of T's Black History Month luncheon. Bon appétit, everyone. Okay, thank you, Mr. President. And um, I'm sure you're watching, so I'll save you some mock steals, that's for sure. Um, uh, I'd like to introduce to you our next um, presenter to make remarks. Um, he is uh, the president, he's actually the principal University of Toronto Scarborough. He's also a vice president here at the university. His name, Wisdom Teddy. Could you please help me in welcoming Wisdom Teddy? Thank you, Glenn. Uh, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. It's great to see a room full of our community represented across all shades, colors, uh, and what we all have in common is our commitment to building inclusive societies. And your presence here is another manifestation of that commitment. As we gather here today, particularly in the penultimate year of the UN Decade for People of African Descent, it's important for us to recognize what we've accomplished, but a lot of work that yet remains to be done. And on occasions like this, it's important that we do not deflate ourselves by dueling on what has not yet been done, but actually using occasions like this to celebrate what we've done together and use that to reinvigorate our commitment to what is to come and to rededicate ourselves as a community to what we should be doing together to make sure that we get to that ultimate goal. A year is not too far away. And it might seem despondent on the part of a lot of people to think that we're not going to have enough runway to get to what we need to do. But it is the commitment of folks like you who every single day make your contributions to reflect the UN Decade's focus on recognition, justice, and development for black people. And all of us here, in our various small ways, are making sure that we're recognizing talent we're propping up that talent to succeed and to do well, that we are infusing in our structures and our processes a commitment to justice through equity, through inclusion, through creating pathways that allow people to access this globally recognized institution that we're all proud to be part of. But we know that what happens here has resonance beyond our walls. And so we have a responsibility not to just those of us who are gathered here in this room, but for those who are further afield from here. And as I was coming in this morning, I saw the young people gathered here uh, thinking about possibility, 
we talk about defying gravity. It is the collective work that we have here that allows us to defy gravity, to make the seemingly impossible possible for a whole lot of people. And we do that not just through words, but through the actions that we're able to demonstrate. And the president said before that we have done a number of things, and we are proud to be able to count them. Because if we can't count them, then it do, they don't exist. It's important that we're able to hold ourselves accountable to the commitments that we've made in the work that has been done by the Anti-Black Racism Tax Force and the commitments that we've made to the Scarborough Charter. At the end of the day, we have to be able to measure ourselves in terms of the principles there. To what extent are we enabling black flourishing in our institution and beyond? To what extent are we embracing inclusive excellence that comes out of the various ways of knowing, including ways in which black societies are able to make contributions, the ways in which our black peers are able to make contributions to our society? And to what extent do we have mechanisms that allow us to measure how well we're doing? Because it's nice to be able to pat yourself on the back, but it's even more important that you sustain that commitment through the actions that you're able to put forward and the results that those actions yield. So on this day, I call on all of us, irrespective of where we sit, where we come from, to assume the leadership in enabling this commitment to bear fruit. If we do that, we'll be individually fulfilled, but we'll be able to lift ourselves up as a community. And I hope that as we leave here, you are not just nourished by the food that we eat. I know the president loves this. But remember to also be nourished by intellectual conversations that you have, by the passion and dedication that each of us brings to the cause. Those are the things that on days that you feel daunted, lift you up. Those are the things that enable you to continue to endure and to make sure that at the end of the day, we don't continue to operate in perpetual you know, endurance, but that we're able to transcend that and actually thrive. So I want to end with a word that I've said every opportunity that I have, which is that we shouldn't be looking at black people and other underrepresented marginal, marginalized communities as equity seeking, because then we're asking them to do the work. I think all of us collectively have to do this work. And if we see one another as deserving of equity, which is why here at the University of Toronto, we talk about equity deserving communities. And I'm proud to say what started from here has been embraced across the country. And looking at people as equity deserving allows us to put an obligation on ourselves as individuals and collectively to ensure that when there's a gap in that, that we work together to correct that. And so if we move in that direction, recognizing that people have been equity denied, but we don't want to dwell on just the denial. We have to be able to commit to getting them to a place where they hold themselves as bona fide members of our society. So thank you. I leave you with a call to continue to dedicate yourselves to this cause, to be there for one another, to make sure that we recognize, we bring justice, and we enable development in these communities. So thank you all so very much. Thank you, Wisdom. I know you was a journey today from Scarborough all the way here, so we appreciate it, and uh, your words are inspiring. Um, I would now like to introduce, for your viewing, a very, very short video. And this uh, video clip has the distinction of being recommended by our guest of honor, Cameron Bailey. So for the most part, it's, um, it's about an icon in the film industry, so there's, there's no chance of you not liking the short video. But if you don't, <laughs> Just remember who, who recommended it. <laughs> uh, um, please, if you will, take a look at this video about the icon, Sidney Poitier, who Cameron has said deserves a second look. The world I knew was quite simple. 
I didn't know there was such a thing as electricity or that water could come into the house through a pipe. I never thought about what I looked like. I didn't know what a mirror was. When you grow up in a community where everything you know is powerful and good and it's black, there's no concept of race that defines Cindy Poitier. I left the Bahamas with this sense of myself. And from the time I got off the boat, America began to say to me, you're not who you think you are. I'm a black man in a white world. There was a habit in Hollywood of utilizing blacks in the most disrespectful ways. And I said, I cannot play that. I don't think Sidney ever played a subservient part. Never plucked his eyes, never ducked his head. They call me Mr. Tibbs. I'm a black man in a white world. I'm a black man in a white world. It was the first time I had seen a black man assert his power. I'm a giant, and I'm surrounded by ants. I wanted to marry Sidney Poitier. He was like, wow. Movie stars should be wow. Biggest box office draw, black man, 1967-68. And the whole country is spiraling around him. We're hanging together by a few cultural threads. And Sidney Poitier is one of those cultural threads. The winner is Sidney Poitier. It's not easy being the first when you have to represent the entire race. He had big shoulders. He was given big shoulders, but he had to carry a lot of weight. If there were equality of opportunity in this business, there'd be 15 Sidney Poitiers and 10 or 12 Belafontes. But there is not. The other way around. Watch it, watch it, watch it. Oh. He's going to put black people in positions where they can have a career behind the camera. He came to this earth to move it, to change it, to shake it. You think of yourself as a colored man. I think of myself as a man. That's the summary of him. I love him so much. My life has had more than a few wonderful, indescribable turns. And I have lived them. Oh, mercy, mercy. Okay, Cameron, I think you're safe. <laughs> um, before I bring up the next presenter, who is a spoken word artist, I'd like to take a couple of seconds, if I could, to just say th thanks to um, some of the people who helped put this together. I'll start off by saying thank you to the Heart House crew, because they're the ones, for over the years, done. they do the cooking. Now I'll say thanks to our University of Toronto events team because without them, we couldn't have done this. Thank you, guys. <laughs> the Heart House programming office. Zoe, you know who you are. Thanks for all your help. I know I'm going to forget some, some people, please forgive me. The organizing committee and all the volunteers, thank you all for all your hard work. <laughs> this year, for some strange reason, I would like to do a quick recognition. We have a bunch of luminaries. I'm not sure if it has anything to do with the guest of honor, but um, I'll go there. Um, there's... I don't think I have enough time to go through all of them, so if, if I forget you, please um, please forgive me. But I'll start off, I think, with um, Cam some of Cameron's group. And I'll, I know I've just saw director Clement Virgo. Uh, Clement, uh, I don't think a lot of people know you. Do you mind? Just quickly, um, is iconic <laughs> Canadian film, film director. I think he just got nominated recently for the Canadian version of an Oscar. I think, tell me if I'm wrong, or for his film, go and watch the film, I think, brother, right? Okay, all right, he's very modest, he's not even, he's not even helping me. <laughs> <laughs> Sally Lee, who's also um, well known amongst the, um, the film crowd. Thank you, Sally. Yeah. Uh, 
director of the Canadian Independent um, Group. Yeah, so thanks, Scrutiny, which is good. Thank you, Sally. Um, let me look at my list here quickly. And again, please forgive me. I'm looking quickly at um, Rosemary Sadler, um, long time OBHS director. Norman Houghton, and we can't forget him because um, he's a major sponsor and he's a pilot and he rep um, represents Air Canada. Um, I, Mitzi called and said she was coming. I don't know if she's here. Oh, she just arrived. Hey, Mitzi, Hunter. <laughs> Mitzi is, of course, longtime MPP for um, Liberal MPP for Scarborough and a double U of T graduate, she likes to remind me, and <laughs> I, I passed honorary. Thank you, Mitzi. Um, who else do I have quickly? Um, the Consul Generals of Barbados and the Consul General of the US are both are all here. Thank you guys for taking time out. Um, I think supermodel Stacy Stacy McKenzie might be here somewhere in the house. I think I saw her earlier. Um, where did she? I know I saw her. Um, Wayne Simmons, I'm not sure. Did Wayne show up? Yeah, he said he was. Um, yeah, it's probably, yeah. Okay. Um, probably recovering from another Leafs loss. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't say that. <laughs> uh, who else do we have? Uh, I don't know. Lena Cordi Cordina, who's a producer. Um, Essa Mensa. Here's a favorite of mine. Essa Mensa. She's a choreographer, dancer for, hear this, Drake. Rihanna and Division. So uh, <laughs> I know we have uh, an airline hostess representatives from Air Canada. Do you guys want to take a quick? But well, you're our sponsors. I don't know if you just want to wave to us or, or no. Okay, <laughs> you. <laughs> Yeah, so thank you to all the Air Canada staff and people who are here. Thank you for showing up. Thank you for your sponsorship. And um, hopefully we'll see you next year too. Right? <laughs> um, the, um, Dwayne De Rosario, who's an MLS soccer player, should have been here. I guess he's not here. But we do have a jersey online uh, at our auction that he has signed. So um, the, the jersey is there. So go ahead and, um, and please um, you know, make, make an offer on it. We have a few other things. Um, part of this lunch, what we do is not just for the food and the fun. We do um, raise funds for Black History Month Lunch and Scholarship Fellowship um, uh, funds, and the funds go towards Black racialized students at UFT who are in need and who have um, who have matched our academic requirements or are in need. So it's for a good cause. If you go to um, go go online and um, the. VP who um, initiated this um, fund last year with a 50,000 uh, donation to kick it off, um, to David Palmer, who, you, who we'll, you will hear from later. Actually, his philosophy is, uh, while the Gravity campaign now is, I think it's, it's a three, mil, three billion campaign, um, he basically says um, he would like our um, scholarship fund campaign to be community-based, meaning that he wants us to get maybe 100,000 community members who donate $10 each or donate $5 or $2. So it's community-based, and please, um, smaller amounts, as small as you can. But um, the Jamaican has a saying, says, um, every nickel make a muckle, if you're Jamaican. That basically means that every nickel that you save eventually becomes a, a dollar, and the dollar becomes whatever, right? Okay, so um, please, um, please. Okay, um, next up on, on, our agenda, on our program agenda is our um, spoken word artist. His name is Eddie Larty, and he has been, I think a couple of years ago, he was a slam poetry, uh, Canadian slam poetry contest, and I see people looking at me saying, what is slam poetry? And it's, doesn't have, does have, it has nothing to do with WWE. So um, uh, please join me in welcoming Eddie Larty. How are we doing? So, um, basic rules for poetry. You can clap, you can snap, uh, you can cheer on during the poem. You don't have to be silent. I know we're in a university. It doesn't always work like that.
The darkest pity party. Me and my shadow exchange horror stories about being black. I say to my shadow, I envy you. No one ever questions the quantity of your blackness. You're never too black or not black enough. You are always just simply black. Without question, without interrogation, I envy how your hands have never felt the chill of cuffs, never been presumed guilty until proven dead, because no matter how hard they try, they can never kill a shadow. And my shadow says to me, I know we both know what it's like to be a walking chalk outline. A shadow's place is either on the ground or against a wall, and everything that makes me uniquely beautiful is robbed of me in the nighttime, and the warmth of my personality and flesh become the tone of nightmares, the skin, nothing more than the fingerprints of a violent night. They label me an angry black man, based my whole existence on throwing shade, and why wouldn't I be angry? I hate the way I sometimes stick out in white spaces. I, I try and comfort my shadow, I say. I envy how close you are to the earth and our roots. No one knows our history the way you do. The melanin in a shadow is a vow. Watch out easily. Two shadows become one flesh. And I want to know a love like this. I love the way you flip the script, appropriate their movements, and call it normal. My shadow says, call it conformity. Call it being puppeted. Call it being spoon-fed, a culture without spice, us dark-skinned individuals have never had the crown of normalcy, never been given the luxury of tears, even though it's clear I feel the weight of everything on top of me. And it's maddening, this code switching we do. In some lights, a shadow has to split itself in two to fit into a workplace where it's tokenized. Present at every board meeting and cannot speak, our glass ceilings the floor to be stepped on and stepped over, give new meaning to overshadowed, and we bond over these memories and pre-written destinies. A connection so close it is almost physical, our kinship, Siamese-like, a brotherhood so real we nod in verification upon meeting one another, for even boxers know, on some nights all you have is your shadow fighting with you, but cops know. The best way to make shadows scatter, swirling lights. Okay, thank you, Eddie, and thank you for making it all the way from Hamilton today. And uh, we, we appreciate that. Uh, the next presenter is the Vice President of the Division of University Advancement, which is this division that is a main sponsor for this event. David has been tremendous advocate, supporter, booster, not only for this event, but for any and all things inclusive and incorporating diversity on the campus here at the university. I remember in a meeting I once said to David, and I'm trying to quote myself, I'm literally shocked, I said to him, that you as a white middle-aged man has become the champion of equity and diversity issues. And I meant it because I said that about three years ago and David has actually gone one step further. He is a champion of equity and diversity issues. He hates when I do this, but um, we need sometimes to give the flowers when they're due. Please welcome a good supporter white, middle-aged man, <laughs> David Palmer, Vice President at the University of Toronto. Thank you, Glenn, for your kind introduction and for your continued dedicated leadership. And thank you, Eddie Larity, for your moving performance. We'll hear from Eddie once more at the close of the program. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you all for joining us, either virtually or at Heart House. It has been my pleasure to attend this event every year. And while I regret that I couldn't join you in person this year, I hope you're all having an amazing lunch together. 
During this current academic year, our faculty, staff, and students have returned to our campuses, and we have returned to hosting in-person events like this one. One of the long-term positive shifts we're maintaining is to deliver hybrid events so that members of our community who may be located anywhere in the world can still take part in our events, lectures, and celebrations like this one. On behalf of the Division of University Advancement, thank you to all the organizers, speakers, and performers this afternoon for making this important luncheon possible. There are some people and groups I would particularly like to acknowledge. First, I want to thank our sponsors and guests this year from Air Canada, Coca-Cola, and Tim Hortons. Thank you all for your support. Thank you also to our guest of honor this year, Cameron Bailey. And a special welcome to all of our past guests of honor joining us today. U.S. Consul General in Toronto, Susan Crystal, City of Toronto staff and employees, rapper and record producer Scarborough Zone, Cardinal Afishal, and many other celebrities and guest artists in attendance. Thank you, President Gertler, as well, for opening the program. Also joining us is Charlie Kyle, principal of Innes College, where Cameron Bailey helps teach our undergraduate film students. All of the staff and community members of Hart House, thank you for hosting us. And the wider university community, including members of all equity, diversity, and inclusion groups. Staff and student guests from Toronto, Peel, York, Durham, and the Greater Toronto Area School Boards. And members of our alumni community joining us from their homes here in Toronto and around the world. Last, but very importantly, I want to thank U of T Advancement broadly, all of the staff volunteers, attendees, and the organizing committees at our three campuses who support and run this event year after year. And in particular, the organizing committees led by Glenn Booth, one of the university's stalwart organizers who launched this event 21 years ago. 21 years. Thank you, Glenn, for your incredible leadership and energy, as always. This luncheon is such a wonderful tradition, a celebration and capstone to the four weeks where we recognize Black History Month at the University of Toronto. So welcome everyone today for celebrating with us and for contributing to our vibrant University of Toronto community. Thank you, David, and uh, just quickly, my apologies to Karen Reed, who is now the acting <laughs> principal at Innes College. Uh, this is what happens when you pre-record a little bit ahead of the, the final day. But Innes is represented big time by the acting principal. And Innes is represented essentially because um, our guest of honor is, uh, was uh, continues to be an in integral part of Innes as part of their um, teaching staff. So um, Innes had to be here with some of their students too. So thank you. Uh, all right, so we're getting to the to we're getting close to the end of it because I know we're getting hungry. Um, at, we'd like to introduce the acting vice president, People's Strategy and Equity and Culture Division, and I'm going to introduce Heather Boone because Heather in the absence of David, who you just heard from, who, was, who always does this when he's present, has kindly consented to be David for today in introducing the guest of honor and presenting the guest of honor with the award certificate. So if you would, don't mind, please join me in welcoming Heather Boone to the stand. Thank you so much, Glenn. Good afternoon, everyone, and also to everyone joining us uh, both in the room and virtually, our students, staff, faculty, and community members. Wherever you are, I hope you're enjoying lunch, but as people have been saying, we're going to have a fabulous lunch in a few minutes here. I also want to add my thanks to the staff to the, uh, from the U of T Advancement. They have contributed so much to, today, to the event's success, and particularly my thanks to the organizing committees at our three campuses. 
Glenn, it's amazing to me uh, how much this event has grown. The fact that we're now broadcasting internationally to our alumni across the world. And year after year, we continue to feature prestigious speakers, including in the past people like the Honorable uh, Jean uh, Augustine, Andre de Grasse has been here, Kimberly, Kimberly Davis, uh, Messiah Jury. Um, so congratulations uh, on the luncheon's continued tremendous success, and so much of this is because of Glenn. Last year, to celebrate the 20th anniversary of the event and to recognize the work of Black History, the Black History Month Luncheon Committee, the university created the Black History Month Luncheon Fund. So this fund provides endow uh, endowed scholarship funds that benefit a black undergraduate student in financial need. And as mentioned already, the university has set up a matching fund for up to a total of $50,000. So I encourage all of you to visit our funding page to learn more about this scholarship and to donate. This initiative is just one of the many ways across our three campuses that we're supporting both black excellence and black futures. We are so fortunate to be guided by the recommendations from the Anti-Black Racism Task Force and the principles of the Scarborough Charter, which Wisdom referenced earlier. We're also drawing on the wealth of expertise, knowledge, and the lived experiences of those within the University of Toronto community. So thank you to all of you who have made this an ongoing priority in your roles, whether it's as students, as faculty, as staff, or librarians across the university. And all of this requires celebration. So I'm happy to acknowledge the very affirming tradition that the Black History Luncheon, for 21 years, as has been discussed many times, has established at the university. This luncheon is an opportunity to break bread and to collectively recognize the vibrant month of programming that has happened throughout the month of February. It also offers an occasion to celebrate a black Canadian who's made important contributions to their profession and to the communities, both locally and nationally. So in David Palmer's absence, I get the privilege to present this year's Advancement Achievement Award to Cameron Bailey, CEO of the Toronto International Film Festival. So prior to his appointment as CEO in 2021, Cameron, as many of you know, was already an industry leader in Toronto's film and entertainment landscape with three decades of experience at TIFF. He was absolutely instrumental in growing TIFF's loyal audiences and ensuring that the festival is an essential stop for filmmakers and industry professionals from around the world. Cameron taught film curation at Innes College and holds an honorary doctorate from his alma mater, the University of Western Ontario. Each year since 2012, Toronto Life magazine has named him among Toronto's 50 most influential people. And he is a, a chevalier in France, France's Order of Arts and Letters and is member at large of the Academy of Motion Pictures, Arts and Sciences. He told me just before this event, you know, he's on his way to the Oscars after us, so. <laughs> so today, Cameron, we are very pleased to prevent you with this appears shortly, um, to present you with an achievement, Advancement Achievement Award. So this Advancement Achievement Award reads as followed. Presented to Cameron Bailey for his continued excellence in helping make Toronto one of the world's top destinations for movie premieres and events. For supporting an expanded range of international voices and perspectives in film, and for being a distinguished role model to our students through his teaching, community contributions, and personal achievements. Thank you so much for accepting this award and for joining us today. Everyone, please join me in welcoming Cameron Bailey. <laughs> they probably want a picture. Thank you. 
Thank you. Thank you, Heather. Thank you, Glenn. Thank you, everyone, for being here. Uh, it's not written in Latin. I'm grateful for that. Um, and I realize that as honored as I am to be here today and that you're all here uh, with us, I'm standing between you and the oxtail. So I'm going to try not to be too long. Uh, I did want to uh, just say a few words. Um, I'm in a position now that I never expected to be in, which is leading one of Canada's top cultural organizations, making decisions that affect sometimes thousands of filmmakers and industry professionals in Canada and around the world, uh, almost 200 full-time staff at TIFF, also leading the getting and the spending of about $40 million every year, which is no easy task. And I never planned to be leading anything. Uh, but I want to talk about a couple things that helped to get me here in case that's useful to anyone in the room. And I want to talk about what happened since I got to this position. I want to talk about leading while black. If you're black in Canada and you've been thinking about leading anything, the facts are against you. We know more and more jobs require a post-secondary education, but did you know that black Torontonians are almost half as likely to hold a bachelor's degree compared to the rest of the population. And even when we do graduate, we live inside the statistic that university-educated black Canadians earn 80 cents for every dollar earned by their white peers. Over 70% of jobs are filled through professional networks, but the networks of black Canadians are smaller and less powerful than those of white Canadians. And if your name sounds black, especially African, you're at a proven disadvantage when it comes to getting a callback response to your job application. White applicants with criminal records do better than black sounding applicants without a criminal record. Half of black employees in Canada report facing discrimination when it comes to promotions and black employees call, face microaggressions, which I actually call micro-humiliations, uh, the questioning of their abilities, and more pressure to adapt to white norms. So how are you going to lead? These stats, by the way, are from a Boston Consulting Group study released in 2020. And I hadn't read any of these statistics until just over two years ago. You'll remember what 2020 meant to many of us in terms of the black community and its impact in the wake of the murder of George Floyd. I hadn't read these stats until that report was released in 2020, but I had felt them, I lived them, and maybe some of you have too. Maybe you grew up learning, like I did, that some teachers and then some professors and then some bosses and coworkers would hold lower expectations of you. They, were, they would assume that you were less capable. Maybe you learned what W.E.B. Du Bois called the double consciousness of being the only black body in the room, seeing yourself through that perspective of lowered expectations of suspicion, fear, and dismissal. So how are you going to lead? Getting to leading while black means imagining you can lead. It means recognizing, truly seeing, that people in leadership positions are not necessarily any smarter or more accomplished or more deserving than you. They might come from privilege. They might have had the ultimate privilege of imagining themselves leading the organizations that they currently work for. How many of us as young black people seeking higher education and fulfilling jobs imagine rising to eventually lead the organizations we'll work for? I can tell you that I did not. And I want to recognize uh, one of my closest friends in the room, Clement Virgo, uh, who is nominated for a whole bunch of Canadian Screen Awards, and he made a brilliant movie called Brother, which you should see, uh, set in Scarborough, by the way. Um, Clement has been my friend for many years. We met each other through the Black Film and Video Network and watched each other as we tried to do the things that we really dreamed of doing in our careers. And at one point, we were sitting down maybe over Oxdale, I don't remember. <laughs> I gotta stop saying that word, it's all I can think about right now is Oxdale. Um, and I had been with TIFF for many years in different roles. And Clement asked me if I'd ever thought about leading TIFF. And I had never 
thought about leading TIF. It just never even entered my mind. Um, TIF had a good leader, and I just never saw myself in that role. It just never occurred to me until my friend Clement mentioned that to me. We talked about it more, and from that point forward, you know, it took many years to get to this position, but it was in my head. It was in my imagination, and that is such an important move. Uh, and for those of you who've never imagined leading the places you work for now, start. <laughs> Imagine yourself there. Once I began that journey, I, I learned about networking while black. So what were my networks? How did they compare to the networks of people who had been to elite schools, sometimes since childhood, elite universities, expensive summer camps, and the cottages where the real power circulates, gap year travel, all of those networks that aren't open to everyone. I learned that a network, though, wasn't just a bunch of powerful acquaintances who might hire me someday. It was friends who could lift me up, who could lift my eyes up to see what more was possible. And I would include my other friend who's here today, Sally Lee. We've had a lot of those conversations over the years as well. I learned about getting in the room. I learned how to express my ideas fully, to push myself to do my job better all the while honing the very necessary black art of diplomacy, dealing with a constant threat of being seen as a threat, all so I could get in the room and realizing there was a room on the other side of that room. And the more rooms you get into, the more you realize what's behind those other rooms. And eventually I learned about navigating the room while black. There's a certain kind of power of observation that comes from being marginalized. So I think it's why Canadians overperform when it comes to American comedy and music and movies. We watch closely across the border, we see what works, we're not in it, but we can observe it. And the same thing is true for anyone who's coming from a marginalized community. You learn the power of mirroring, of mimicry, of code switching, that double consciousness is actually your superpower. Anyone marginalized by society can access it. We can see from the outside how power operates. If you've seen The Matrix, and we've all seen The Matrix, right? <laughs> if you've seen The Matrix, you know that moment near the end where Neo can finally see the world as just dancing green code. He's deciphered it. He can see how it works. And that's what we can do once we give ourselves an access to that power. You can train yourself to do that, to look at power in that way. I learned about hiring while black once I began to be in a position to hire. Are you gonna be scrutinized or even criticized for hiring too many racialized people, too many black people? Probably. But at least in Canada, that scrutiny and that criticism could be very quietly and carefully couched. So you gotta look out for that too. And I learned about tokening while black, how my mere presence in a room or in media or in a certain role can reassure a society that everything's okay. Everything is not okay. Most importantly, I learned that leading while black means I am not the diversity. I'm not the change. I'm here to help make the change. I'm here to open doors for other racialized and other marginalized people whose talent and whose abilities are not being fully recognized, to shine a light on them, to speak up when th things get shady in the room. And I loved the idea of the shadow. Um, when things get shady in the room that you've worked yourself into, you need to shine a light. You need to keep pushing for more genuine equity, to make time for people who didn't make it into that room yet, to share what you learned, which is why leading while black is never gonna be easy, but for me, it's been a gift. Thank you. Thank you so much, Cameron. That was inspirational, 
even at my age, you just inspired me to do more. I was, before that speech, I was thinking about retiring. <laughs> But thank you. And um, Karen, thank you for the introductory remarks and the presentation. Yeah. Thank you very much. Now, we're getting closer to the oxtails. <laughs> we will now segue into a quick, with the operative word being quick, Q&A with, uh, with, with Cameron. So Cameron, if you don't mind, you could join me on stage. Quickly after that, there's another special presentation. That's not the only one you get today. The government of Barbados has dipped into their coffers <laughs> and decided to present you something on, on their behalf. So let's get the Q&A out of the way so we can get your second award. Okay, thank you for deciding to hang out and spend some time with us. Uh, My pleasure. Yeah. I know you, uh, you had to mention Hollywood, and I know you usually hang out at round tables with, um, um, let's see, uh, Brad Pitt. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, Barbara I do Spitz. not text these people, okay, just so you know. <laughs> you know. They come to Toronto because the audience here is amazing, uh, and I happen to be there. All the I way. know, I see you hugging Brad Pitt all over the place. That's all I <laughs> right. <laughs> I'm not hating on you. This is the closest I'll get to Hollywood, so I'm taking it. <laughs> um, just to start off, though, I'm, I would like to welcome you to the family the, as the newest member of the family at UF, University of Toronto. Thank you. Yeah. And um, your award, uh, I don't know how close you'll hang it to the, your Western degree, but hopefully it's on the same wall. <laughs> or, A place of honor, no yeah, doubt. Yeah, okay. no, I'm glad to hear that. Um, he probably says different once he leaves, but we're taking it for now. <laughs> uh, I'd also like to ensure that you get to meet your fellow um, awardee, uh, Mitzi, so Mitzi, make sure you. I know Mitzi. Yeah, you Mitzi do. Okay. Go way all right. Okay. All right. <laughs> Good stuff. So that it's done. All right. My job is done. Uh, okay. We're not. It's not supposed to happen. Guess where my questions are. Yeah, so that's why I'm not in Hollywood, right? <laughs> yeah. Okay, Mr. Bailey, first off, here's my question. You are extremely active with um, Black History Month engagements within the community, I've noticed. You're a busy man, aside from traveling the world. Um, why is this important for you? You know, my feeling about Black History Month has changed I would say, um, I used to be a little hesitant, honestly, you know, the, the, old, the old things that people always say, it's the coldest month, shortest month of the year, why is that the month for black people? Um, and it didn't feel right that everything was so concentrated into these 28 days. I've since begun to feel that it is an opportunity that we should all take advantage of. Doesn't mean we have to stop on March 1st, but I, so I've, I've begun to try to, to take part more, and it's a great opportunity just to connect with community as well, um, so long as it doesn't end when the month ends. Okay, all right. Yeah. I also have to um, say thank you for what you do, because I've been doing this for 21 years, and trying to engage people like you of influence to actually um, be proactive and be active in, in, in the month, and not all black leaders or black necessarily support or engage as much as they could, for whatever reason. So the fact that you do it, uh, I'd like to say, on behalf of the community, uh, I'd like to say thank you for, for, for taking the time. You're thank busy. you. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so let us also now start with your family. Like a lot of, a lot of it begins there, right? Um, I've read that your, your mother who passed away, she passed away a few years back, and you have talked about her influence on you during your formative years. 
So here's my question. Given the amazing arc and the trajectory of your career, which isn't over, did you two ever manage to somehow share and enjoy your success together? Do you feel you've done her proud? My mother was a nurse in the emergency ward at Northrop General Hospital for over 30 years. Uh, so shout out to all the nurses. And if you're lucky enough to have a mother who was a nurse or a father who was a nurse, nurses don't play, yeah. as we know. <laughs> <laughs> so the discipline in terms of schoolwork and everything else and achievement came from my mother, I would say. Um, she did come to the festival sometimes, and in um, 2009, we brought a film called Precious to the festival. We played it in Roy Thompson Hall, our most prestigious, our largest house. Precious was a movie that was directed by Lee Daniels, but it had a remarkable group of people around it, including executive producers Oprah Winfrey and Tyler Perry, and Mary J. Blige did a song in it, and Mariah Carey was in the movie, <laughs> and they all came to Toronto for the premiere. And my mother was there, she was in the room, and I think that was a very proud moment for both of us because it was just unimaginable. We'd never done a premiere with that caliber and that scale of black talent in the same place at the same time, and my mom got to see it, so I'm very grateful for that. All right, yeah, I know how you feel, I know. I know if, if I ever had half of your life, I know how, what my mom would still be talking about. <laughs> <laughs> that would be her source of life right there. <laughs> um, uh, you have traveled the world. You've been exposed to different cultures, nationalities, all of that. How has this panoramic view, as it were, influenced your views on diversity, equity, and inclusion values? I'm going to answer that question from a kind of a funny place. Wisdom and I were just talking about Scarborough and how the world is in Scarborough. Um, I only just recently kind of landed on the fact that Scarborough has this remarkable equality of diversity in that the South Asian community, the East Asian community, the black community, the European white community are all roughly in balance in terms of their, their demographic numbers in Scarborough. And although I didn't, I can't claim to have grown up entirely in Scarborough, I did spend some time living in Scarborough. My mother spent most of her time in Canada there. Uh, my wife's parents live there right now. My son's playing for the Scarborough Blues basketball team. Scarborough Blues, yes. <laughs> um, so I spent a lot of time in Scarborough. So I guess, you know, before I started getting on planes to travel, the curiosity about other cultures, the interest in other cultures, um, the idea that there was no one culture that could or should dominate human experience, that was already there. I, I kind of was swimming in that from the beginning. And so I love going to other parts of the world, especially where I am a complete stranger. You know, I have walked around Busan in South Korea as the only black man and have people call out to me, hey, Michael Jordan, you know, because I, I look a little bit like Michael Jordan. <laughs> Um, and, you know, I've been, you know, through many countries in Africa, in Asia, in Latin America, and, and I love that, and I feel that it, it enriches what I do professionally, but especially just who I am as a person. Thank you, sir. I know I grew, I spent some of my youth in Scarborough, too, so I know exactly what you mean. Um, in terms of the balance of the cultures and the nationalities, I loved that you could go on Lawrence some, in Scarborough, and you could get Sri Lankan rice right next to the Jamaican rice and peas right next door, sometimes in the same restaurant. Right? Yeah. <laughs> so Scarborough is, Scarborough, is, Scarborough is cool like that. Um, so you go back to your family. You're a proud papa. And your wife, and you and your wife, you're proud parents of a biracial son. How does that impact, if at all, the lessons that you try to teach your son? I mean, I think it's up to him to teach us lessons now. He's 13 years old, he's a point guard. <laughs> and um, uh, my wife is Chinese-Canadian from, she was born in Manitoba, her parents are from Malaysia um, and from um, uh, China by way of Burma. 
um, Myanmar now. And so it, there's a real mix in the house. And so what our son, Tate, is teaching us now is about his experience because he is both black and Asian. He is Blasian, and he's looking for sort of Blasian role models around, and it turns out there are more and more of them now. Um, and understanding what his experience is like, I think is gonna enrich how we understand our own identities as well. All right, thanks. Um, what, yeah, we're gonna wrap this up pretty quickly, because if we do, so uh, what's, what's, what's the next one? You sh I should say, I have no doubt that you apply your DEI values in your personal life. You, you alluded to this a little bit earlier on. So in your professional life as a CEO of TIP, share with us some of the challenges or the joys in incorporating these values in the workplace. It's a big question. I'm going to try and keep it brief because we talk about this at TIF all the time. Uh, we have had a long history of pursuing diversity, equity, and inclusion before that was an expression through our programming and the audiences uh, that we encourage to come to, the, to a festival in the year round to the light box as well. But it's hard. Uh, and um, maybe the hardest part of it is that it's never just one person who can accomplish this, especially sometimes if you are the leader of an organization. And we've certainly seen in the last few years many more racialized folks become the leaders of organizations. But the organizations might still have you know, a kind of a, a colonial history, let's call it that. And so one person in one role, even if it's the leader, is not gonna change that overnight, right? I mean, I think you understand what I'm talking about. <laughs> so that is the job. It's about who else do you need around the table to help make those decisions? How can you actually filter the ideas of diversity, equity, and inclusion fully down and across and through the whole organization so it is lived and breathed by everyone. Uh, and that takes a lot of effort. Thank you. And um, thanks for that. That was, uh, I think Heather, who was, <laughs> I thought, I saw her shaking her head. So that's a good takeaway from, for the, for the equity and um, what we used to call human resources back in the days, but um, okay, Heather, thumbs up. We're good. All right. Um, all right, so uh, we're going to top this off quickly with a couple of questions from the kids um, who are next door. And I'm warning you know that they, like, they want to have a quick hello from you over there. There's another room. I'm not sure if we said this earlier, but there's a, another room over in the East Common Room where we had over 200 high school students from across the GTA who used to be part of this main room. But the demand was so great for them to have their own space that we actually went out and had uh, a program for the high school students um, separately. Um, thanks to the sponsorship of Air Canada. And um, it, it was awesome. But um, I'm just saying that because they want to see you later on. Um, there's a lot of people, and I'm now worried about how much oxtail we have. <laughs> <laughs> Please tell me there's enough. <laughs> Yeah, no, there's, a, we made enough for, we always make enough for 600 people, so it's all right. Uh, so questions from the kids. Um, Cameron, which superhero would you be and why? <laughs> right, I mean, apart from Michael Jordan. Um, superhero. I'm going to actually, I'm going to go back to Neo, right? Neo from the Matrix, that kind of power, that would be incredible. Yeah, that's a good answer. All right. Um, do you ever get tired of watching movies they want to know? <laughs> I never get tired of watching great movies. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So that pretty much answers the second one. They, 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 I want you to know if you have ever fallen asleep in a movie. Which I, <laughs> um, I have fallen asleep in a movie. Oh, no, na no names. Okay. Yeah, no, 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 no. But yeah, <laughs> of course. And, and to me, that is... That's, the, that's your opinion of the movie. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> right, right there. <laughs> was, it, was it a Brad Pitt movie? No. <laughs> uh, Sean Connery or Roger Moore as James Bond? <laughs> this, is, this is a question about how old you are, yes, right? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but we've already done Sydney Party, um, so we're yeah, good. Yeah, okay. <laughs> So, I would say, I mean, they're, they're, they're so different. I'm going to go with Sean Connery, but I have to say, hey. all right, right answer. Uh, you know, 
you go back to the totally cheesy, corny yeah. Roger Moore ones. And they're, they're, they're fun to watch, but Sean Connery. Yeah. All right. Yeah. All right. <laughs> this is the 50th anniversary of hip hop. I don't know if the whole room know that, but it is. And um, <clears throat> so the question is, and this is another generational thing: Tupac or Biggie Smalls? <laughs> <laughs> Missy Elliott. <laughs> <laughs> I love Missy. Oh. Uh, innovator. All right. So, um, last question, sir. Um, it's a food question. Flying fish. And for those of you who don't know, flying fish is the Barbadian national dish. And um, it's the, I think it is, right? Or, uh, and so it's flying fish, jerk, or curry? <laughs> is, is that actually a question? <laughs> Come on now. So, <laughs> I'm a proud Bajan. It's got to be flying okay. fish. <laughs> <laughs> Much as I love the others, uh, got to be flying fish. It's all right. I'm Jamaican, but you're the honored guest. So uh, <laughs> I'm going to let that, I'm gonna let that one slide. <laughs> oh, Lord. Um, man, that was, this was fun. I wish we could have gone on a little bit longer. <laughs> but we do have to eat. Um, any questions from the, a couple of quick questions from the, from the audience? Um, Eddie, we're not paying you for this, right? <laughs> okay. That's a great question. Again, we could talk for hours. There are books written about this. Um, you know, I think maybe the important thing to note in this context is that black creativity has this incredible global influence that we should always celebrate and understand where it comes from and what, what it took to create that, right? All of the great art that comes from the blues, from jazz, from reggae, from hip hop, from all forms of black music, from the great black authors and visual artists and filmmakers, all of that is drawing on a lived experience that is not just a style, right? So that to me is the important part. It becomes a style, it can be taken up by anybody all over the world. There's, the whole world makes hip hop now, the whole world break dances, you know, all of that is, that's, that's just a fact of global culture. But never forget where it comes from. That, that's, that's the only thing I have to say about creating while black. Okay. Is that it? No more? Okay. All right. Mr. Bailey, thank you very, very much for... And thank you. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. It's been an honor. Yeah. The opportunity. You might as well stay right there because I'm going to invite up the Consul General of Barbados. He's uh, Sonia Marvel Carter. Special little presentation on behalf of the government. Go, please welcome Sanya. Yes. Good afternoon, everybody. Please let me apologize for being a little late. I had another engagement. Um, there are a number of things that Cameron said that's kind of jumping out at me here. The, the bit that I heard as I came in. First off, you're a proud Bajan, and your son is Blajan. So, you know, I'm sorry, I couldn't help that. That was just a wonderful play on words. Um, I just want to let everybody know how proud Barbados is of all of its citizens. And Cameron is no exception. We've had some exceptional people, but he is doing phenomenal work here, and we are so proud of him. And that's why it was very important when we were invited to participate today that we jumped at it and said, of course we will. Um, there's always time to recognize and herald our own, so we make time for that every opportunity that we get. Um, so that's why, like I said, it was so important for me to be here. A little stretched, but I had to be here. And I called to say, I'm going to be late, but I will be here. Um, and another funny thing 
it was a good thing that you chose flying fish when they <laughs> asked that question. Let me explain why. Because a part of the gift is a flying fish sculpture. Yes. So thank you so very much <laughs> for saying flying fish. So this is a flying fish sculpture, and they've already told you this is part of the national dish of Barbados. Flying fish and cuckoo is our national dish, and flying fish, so we have a flying fish sculpture that is just typically Bajan. And it's made, it was sculpted in Barbados. Actually, I came in from Barbados on Wednesday, so two days ago, and we got it sculpted there from our mahogany, from one of our sculptors in Barbados. So this was done in Barbados. So actually, come over now, Cameron. Let me present you. So I'm going to put this down. Mm -hmm. Not my bag, but mm -hmm. because this is so important now, we had the whole flying fish discussion. <laughs> <laughs> so on behalf of the government of Barbados, I would want to present this to you in Acknowledging your achievements, acknowledging all that you do and will continue to do at TIFF and generally on behalf of black people everywhere. And you know that Barbados is approximately 92% black. So we don't celebrate necessarily Black History Month in February, but in February we celebrate African awareness mm. in Barbados. So kind of similar, but thank you so very much for all the work you do. Thank you. Thank you so much. And the second part of our presentation is a citation, like I said, from the government of Barbados to Cameron Bailey. And this is in recognition, of course, of all the work that he's doing, the award of excellence from the Consulate General of Barbados to you. Thank you. Thank you so much. I just want to quickly say, Council General, thank you so much. Thank you for making the time. And I cannot wait. It's been about four years since I've been in BIM. So too long. Yes. I'll be back soon. Thank you. Wow. Imagine that. They... Barbados had to up it on us. They, we only gave him an award certificate. You had to, we have to step up for a game next time. There's a, geez. <laughs> um, okay, so we, we mentioned earlier that Cameron is part of the faculty and teaching staff at Innis College. So we have actually saved, basically, he's a better friend to Innis than any other part of the university. So please welcome the acting principal of Innis College to have the final say um, on this honored guest. Principal Reed. Good afternoon, everybody. It's a real pleasure to be here. And uh, for, just give me one second, and then I promise we'll be, well, actually, it's up to Glenn when we get the food. But, um, I, for, for all the students here or, or people who don't know, Innes College is one of the colleges within arts and science, and it's home to the Town Hall Theatre, where films are shown, I think, practically every night of the week. And uh, it's no, n none of us will be surprised uh, that, that Cameron has been instrumental in changing the landscape of film I in Toronto. And the, the Cinema Studies Institute, which is housed in Innes College, is a great beneficiary of that. And Cameron's shared his expertise with students and staff and faculty so over many years, including teaching a course, and he's been very generous with his time. But even more importantly, as he alluded to in his, in his uh, speech, uh, inspired and, and wisdom also talked about the possibility and the imagination uh, for all of the students here and, and the high school students who are also joining us. Uh, to have that imagination and to explore the possibilities. And uh, it, it, TIFF has changed the ability of graduates from the Cinema Studies Institute to make their way into the film and entertainment industry. And so I want to say thank you for that as well. And it's an honor having you here. Thank you.
Thank you, Karen. And thank you, uh, thank you, Cameron. Um, one last, quickly, one last thing before we uh, go to lunch. Um, we have Air Canada has actually graciously sponsored an airline ticket to anywhere in North America, the Caribbean, and and wherever. In any ways, we we're gonna draw from the. If you entered your, if you actually registered to be online, your name to be here in person, your name is in this is in this um, thing. So we have the rep from Air Canada, Norman Houghton. Is he gonna do it right there? Okay, so drum roll, please. <laughs> okay, first winner is... Michelle Mala. Marianne Tastamidala. Thank you, Norman. Since we do we uh, we have some more Tim Horton stuff. Could you do just two quick two names? Just two names quickly and just over here. One uh, we have um, some gift certificates you're here. Well, let's just do that. Thank you, Norman. Thank you, Air Canada. Okay, is Claire Neri here? No. Claire, all right. Okay, so okay, Claire, we'll, we'll, you come, you come and talk to us later. All right. Okay, it's a fifty dollar gift uh, for Tim Hortons, who's also one of our sponsors. Um, Serena, are you here? No. Okay. All right. That's. Michelle Mala. Again? Oh, that's it. Oh, okay. Thank you. All right. Well, <laughs> it takes Timmy's for the airplane, right? <laughs> um, Yvonne Yang. All right. So that's, yeah. That's, that's it then. All right. So we're going to go off to have lunch now. Is Abigail from the chaplain's office here? She will actually be saying grace uh, before we eat because that's part of our tradition. We all, as our grandmothers or mothers, we could never put our hands on the plate until grace is said at the risk of losing your fingers. Yeah, you go right ahead. And, and right after grace, we'll just line up and go get some oxtails. Hello. Hello. Don't worry, we're near to the oxtail now. Um, so as a Christian, I'll be praying this prayer of thanks in a way that is true to my own beliefs. But I recognize there are many different religious backgrounds and perspectives on faith represented in this room today. Um, but I'm grateful that we can share this experience in friendship and mutual respect. Um, so dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity to gather here today in person to celebrate Black History Month and reflect on the accomplishments and achievements of those in the black community. We thank you for the talents and gifts that you have blessed each and every one of us with and the opportunity to highlight those here today. We pray that as Black History Month comes to an end, we will continue to reflect on our history and use it to inform a better future. Thank you again, Lord, for your provision and the hands that have provided the food we are about to eat. We thank you for all those gathered here today and pray that you will bless our meal and time together. In your name we pray, amen. amen.